Good morning and welcome to Travis Baptist this morning. Pastors in Australia are still out gallivanting around, so keep them in your, your prayers as they travel. Uh, still out tomorrow, should be back in the office on Tuesday. So if you'd stand, we'll get started with singing. Come into his presence. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise, and give him praise. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart. Your voices raise, your voices raise. Give glory and honor and power. with thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise and give him praise come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart your voices raise your voices raise give glory and honor and power Today's scripture reading is from Psalm 68, 1 through 4. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let those also who hate him flee before him. But let the righteous be glad, let them rejoice before God. Yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time to come together and worship you, and we ask that you use us to be a light in a dark world. We know that there's those who are suffering with pain. We ask that you seek to relieve their pain and be encouraged that they are loved, that they are loved by a community of your believers. We ask that you work on us uh, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, as you have loved us. We ask that you watch over those who are uh, traveling, as the pastor is traveling, that you bless them with safety. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Good morning. This is November 7th. 2021 already we're going downhill into the holiday season Christmas is coming up we're going to be having our Christmas cantata here it's going to be December 11th December 11th be sure to mark your calendars and don't miss it whichever the second Sunday is the second Sunday it's 12th December 12th December 12th be here the second Sunday of December um, we've got a lot of things happening around Travis Baptist Church. We've got, um, of course, the pastor's out on vacation this week. Hopefully, um, they've been having a, a good time off. Uh, we do have the shoebox ministry. They're going to be, shoeboxes are going to be packed, I think, today at 3.30. Is that right? Today at 3.30. So if you would uh, like to help uh, those around the world... The Franklin Graham Ministry has that shoebox ministry that we're a part of, and they will be packing shoeboxes this afternoon, 3.30, and they could certainly use your help. Um, Tuesday, November 9th, is going to be the adult uh, senior, the senior adult fellowship. Uh, they're going to have the signing, uh, card signing on November 10th. Um, as always, every Sunday morning at 9.30, uh, we have Sunday school here at Travis Baptist Church uh, to learn more about uh, what the Bible has to say. Some things that, the, that are going on the calendar, the youth on December 11th, that's a Saturday, December 11th, uh, in the evening, there's going to be the youth fellowship, it's going to be our white elephant 
uh, g gathering that's going to be at the Humbaz. They're, they've agreed to open up their home. We're going to be going around to look at the Christmas lights and uh, exchange gifts and have a little celebration there at the Humba home at 6.30 on December 11th, so mark your calendar if you're interested to attend that. And then on December 12th, we do have uh, the youth are going to have a visitor. It's going to be a special guest, a Christian author, Alyssa Hope Wagner, will be here at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. If you're interested, certainly see me about that. Also, a new uh, that we discussed in Sunday school this morning on January 22nd, which is a Saturday, January 22nd, there is going to be the Science and Faith Conference in Denton, Texas. And um, Mrs. Stowers and I are planning to, to go uh, attend that. These are experts. These are experts in the field of study, in particular scientific disciplines, including uh, Dr. Stephen Meyer. I have his book, uh, his latest book that just came out a couple of months ago, which was The Return of the God Hypothesis. Uh, his thesis is that the scientific community uh, is becoming more looking at the evidence as a whole and going less atheist and more to the conclusion that there is an intelligent designer obviously pointing to God, that God does exist. And this will be a conference on that. Um, if you're interested in it, they do have a live stream available for that. Or if you are interested to go in person with me, please let me know. That will be January 22nd. That's a Saturday in Denton, Texas. And... Uh, let me read this from the back of the bulletin. It states the all committee meeting, all committee meeting, November 14th at 5 p.m. in the sanctuary. Everyone from every committee, we need to have a meeting to get everybody organized and on the right track. We need to make sure each committee has a chair, understands its responsibilities, who can be reelected in December, etc. Please make plans to be present for November 14th at 5 p.m. So if you're interested in serving on a community in a committee, if you are part of a committee, be present so that uh, so that we can work out work out those details. November 14th at 5 p.m. Anything else that we need to add? Oh, for the shoebox ministry, we do have a video. I, I almost forgot. Let's get you excited about this Operation Christmas Child. Again, we have the Packing of the shoe boxes at 3.30 p.m. this afternoon. Here's a video to get you energized. My name is Paku. I am from Southeast Asia. When I was four, my country was going through a civil war. My family were, was persecuted. Um, my village got burned. We got kicked out of our village and we ended up in a refugee camp in Thailand. And in refugee camp, it was crowding. We live in a house that looked more like a tent and uh, people were sick. When I see all these, these things that are happening around me, my mind and my heart question me like, why do I had to go through this? Why do I had to live this life? This can be my life forever to live like this. And in my heart, I told myself that there's something better for me. And uh, when I was seven, I received a shoebox. And I was very, very happy. I remember sitting with other kids and when I opened it, there was a dress, a yellow dress. It was beautiful. I tried it on and fit me perfectly. It is perfect to wear it for summer in hot weather. So I wear it most of the time until it get old. I ended up live in refugee camp for 10 years. I never received a gift like that before. Somebody out there said this shoebox, when I don't even know them or they don't even know me, I realized how God loved me and no matter what, He provided for me and He has a, a future and a plan for me. Thank you so much for your hard work and your dedication to pack those shoebox. It made a huge impact in my life, like somebody like me. So thank you.
that is great news and, and great joy. We're so glad to be a part of that. And uh, if you want to be a part of it again, 3.30 this afternoon, shoebox packing. Uh, so at this time, we do want to welcome our guests. Uh, we do have on the side of the bulletin, we have this uh, portion that tears out. It um, has some information that we'd like to get from you if you're visiting for the first time or the first time in a long time. Just tear this side portion off, fill it out, and put that in the offering plate, and we'd love to hear from you. And uh, as we take this time, let's welcome each other to church. As we make it back to our places, we will continue to stand. Waiting for Donna to get, there we go. As we make it back to our places, we'll sing For the Beauty of the Earth. Thy 
selfless gift divine to our race so freely give for that great great love of thine peace on earth and joy in heaven lord of all to thee we raise this our this time the children may be excused to head on up to children's church as they head out the rest of us will sing count your blessings when upon life's billows you are tempest tossed when you are discouraged thinking all is lost count your many blessings name them one by one and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you till your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Please be seated. Well, as I said, the pastor is on vacation this week. He's out traveling. We definitely want to be in prayer for the pastor and his family is, and for all those traveling, this is coming into the Christmas season. There will be a lot of people traveling for Thanksgiving and Christmas, but there's also going to be a lot of loneliness that happens over the next uh, couple of months. We want to be in prayer that we can reach out to those who may feel lonely so that they can understand that they are, they are loved and that they are valuable and that we care for them. As believers, that is that is uh, what God wants for us. And so we do that as a, as a church family, pray together in this uh, time to pray as together as a family for those who are hurting, those who are traveling, those who are celebrating, that they celebrate correctly. It's an it's a expression that we do together corporately in a discipline for God. And so let's take this time to pray together as a family.
God, you are the creator of the universe. You are the divine planner for our lives. We know that your will for this world is for it to be a loving world, and there is a lot of a lot of chaos. There's a lot of disorder. There's a lot of pain and suffering. We ask that you work on our hearts that we are able to use the eyes that Jesus had to see the needs of those around us. We ask that you work on our heart that we that our heart breaks for those who are hurting and that we can look through our resources, our talents, our skills, our resources to provide some relief, but most importantly, to share love for those around us. We ask that you work on our hearts as we visit with families over the next couple of months, that we enjoy our family time together, that we look to our immediate family And if we have some struggles, if we have some tensions, if we have some hurt feelings, that we we are able to overlook that and extend some grace. That we are able to love our family and be a model of what Christ was for this world. That we be more Christ-like, that we extend grace so that people who are hurting, people who need to know you more, that they can see you working through us. Instead of arguing at the dinner table over politics or past wrongs, that we can instead joyfully share time together and build healthy relationships that start with knowing you. We know that you are love and that you have loved us. And because you love us and extended us grace, that we can extend grace to our neighbors, those who have wronged us, and we can offer hope for a better future, a future that Jesus made for us in dying on the cross for salvation for a hurting and broken world. And in that time that we reflect, that we know that church is essential, that we come to worship you to make a better future for ourselves, which starts with changing ourselves, that we become a better person. We transform to be more Christ-like, and we do that by the encouragement of the believers in this room, that we look around, help one another, encourage one another, and let everyone know that God really exists. Jesus really exists. And his plan of salvation is the one that saves us all. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In Job, God said, consider my servant Job. And the devil, you know, did the whole excuse of, well, you've got a protection around him. Well, Job went through a whole bunch of trials, and Job never understood why he went through a whole bunch of trials. But in no time did Job ever, you know, blame God for his, his, the turmoil that he went through. Through it all, he gave thanks and glorified God. We as Christians have examples of that throughout the Bible. That's an advantage that we have. We have Job's story telling us that sometimes we go through things, nothing of our own accord, but we're called to to give thanks to God through it all. So let's join together with singing, Give Thanks. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. 
Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. And now let the weak say, Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. Give thanks. Let's go ahead and stand for our offertory. And if you haven't dropped your offering in the offering plates or your communication cards in the offering plates, if you please feel free to jump out and do that as we sing. We are so blessed. We are so blessed by the gifts from your hand. I just can't understand why you've loved us so much. We are so blessed, we just can't find a way, or the words that can say, thank you Lord for your touch. When we're empty, you fill us to we cause us to know we are so blessed take what we have to bring take it all everything Lord we love you so much we are so blessed by the gift from your hand I just can't understand why you've loved us so much we are so blessed take away for the words that can say thank you Lord for your touch when we're Till we overflow when we're hungry, you feed us and cause us to know we are so blessed. Take what we have to bring, take it all, everything, Lord, we love you so much. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your blessings. We have lives that we can live victoriously because your son beat death on the cross. Your son died for our sins that we can live eternally with you, Lord. These lives that we have here on earth are only temporary, but our life with you is everlasting. And we need to live like that, Lord. We need to live as we have life eternal and not worry about tomorrow because you've got it, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we have to 
to bring back part of our blessings, to bring in our tithes and our, and our offerings, Lord, and ask, Lord, that you just take these and multiply them in the ways that you can so not only that we can get to this community, that we can reach out to the state, this country, and the world around us, Lord, that others may come to know you and turn away from the wicked ways and learn to celebrate life that you have for them. And we ask, Lord, that you just continue to guide our footsteps and forgive us, forgive us when we sin against you, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning again. This is uh, November 7th, 2021. We're already into November. I, like I said earlier that I'm surprised that I went to the store just the other day and they were playing the Christmas music. They are, the stores are already in full force with Christmas and I'm I resist. I say, no, there's a Thanksgiving we've got to celebrate before we get to Christmas. In my house, we don't, we don't start decorating for Christmas until the Friday after Thanksgiving, because we, like we like to celebrate our holidays. Uh, so today we're going to be in uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. So while you're flipping to, first Col for, to Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, if you use the Bible in the pew in front of you, it's on, it can be found on page 1045. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. So if you'll stand while I read God's word, please. Colossians 1, chapter 1 through 14. This is out of the New King James Version. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us, your love in the spirit for this reason we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the lord fully pleasing him being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of god strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the, the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into, into the kingdom of the sons of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time to come together and read your word publicly, that we publicly profess that Jesus is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, that Jesus came to this earth. He was crucified and rose from the dead so that he could pave the way for salvation for all humanity. We know that it is your desire that all come to, come to you, but not all will. We ask that you use us to spread love to a loveless world, and we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. So my role here at Travis Baptist Church is to teach Bible lessons and coach teenagers in Christian living so that they may grow to be spiritually healthy adults. And a component of that is to be thankful, to appreciate 
those around us for the contributions they have made. If you're anything like me, um, maybe you've been discouraged. We have been discouraged and feel like our contributions go you know, unappreciated, maybe that we feel like we're doing this all for nothing, maybe uh, any, anything that I'm trying to do to be helpful is only met with hostility. Sometimes we may feel that way, but a good component is to be encouraged that if you are doing the work for God, God certainly thanks you. And that's, that's what we're gonna look at today is appreciating others' contributions, to recognize the contributions people have made for the glory of God that have improved our lives, have made us better people, rather than selfishly turning into ourselves, that we look selflessly at others, at their contributions. Um, story that I have to share with you is about Roger Williams, if you've never heard of him. Um, of course, this was a message that I, I had originally planned to have uh, for the last week of this month, uh, but because Mrs. Stowers and I are going to be out of town for Thanksgiving and that weekend, uh, Pastor and I have switched, so that's why I'm doing it today. So I looked at the Mayflower. The Mayflower came in 1620 from England, and uh, brought pilgrims. These were, they knew they were pilgrims. They were not Puritans. Puritans, that's a different thing. They came three years later, but the, the pilgrims, they were actually separatists. So they're Christians. They broke away from the Anglican Church, the Church of England. Um, this is uh, the church that was established by King Henry VIII when he broke off from the Catholic Church to make his own church. And the king was in charge of the church, which means that your tithe went to the king. Uh, the king said how things are done in the church. The king, at his will, could say, these are the practices that will be done in the church and how you will live your life. The separatists disagreed with that. They were Protestant, and they wanted to be more closer to the, the biblical teachings. And so they left England. They first went to... Den to um, to Denmark, they went to Holland first, and then they, they came over to uh, the New World so that they could establish a church and they wanted to make a new England. They wanted to have, they wanted to build the structures and build from scratch the world in which they grew up in with all the good things that they remembered and they could worship the way they wanted to. And that's what the pilgrims wanted to do. Well, their pastor, pastor of Plymouth, Massachusetts, at that time, well, it wasn't Massachusetts at the time, but Plymouth, the Plymouth colony, was Roger Williams. And Governor Bradford, who presided over the first Thanksgiving, William Bradford, after several years, um, decided to do away, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna have someone else be the preacher. We don't like these strange teachings that Roger Williams is doing. Roger Williams went south and uh, went with the Puritan community in Salem, Massachusetts. For a couple of years, he was a teacher there. He, he, they didn't have him be pastor because they thought his teachings were a little weird. Uh, he then was, um, because his teachings were so unorthodox and so bizarre, that Governor Bradford and the entire Massachusetts colony kicked him out. They prohibited him from, being, from remaining in the colony, and he went to an island that is today called Rhode Island, and he founded a town called Providence. He and 10 other people started a church, and it became the first Baptist church in the New World. The first Baptist church of the New World, Providence, Rhode Island, founded by Roger Williams. His uh, unorthodox, weird beliefs included the priesthood of every believer, believing that we have a direct connection to God. When we pray, we're praying to directly to God. We do not need the mediator. Jesus is our mediator according to Roger Williams. Uh, religious liberty, that the church should be independent from the government. He also believed in the autonomous church. That means that Travis Baptist Church is not connected to other Baptist church. He, even Baptist churches that are just down the street, we are independent because we have 
a believer's church, which means that the congregation is in charge. The congregation decides who's going to be the pastor, who's not going to be the pastor, who's going to be in charge, and how we do things. These are the fundamental tenets of a Baptist church, and that started with John Smith over in, in England, but um, was carried over by Roger Williams into the New World. So the, the idea that Roger Williams had that transcends to us today, including those, um, is also it's, uh, written biblically, and we find that in the church in Colossae. The church in Colossae, Colossae is a town that is in present-day Turkey. It is in the interior, so Paul never visited Colossae. Paul, who visited um, Ephesus, and we believe that, according to Dr. N.T. Wright, that Paul was imprisoned in Ephesus uh, for a period of time and was visited by Epaphras. Epaphras came the 100-mile journey from the inland of what is present-day Turkey down the valley to Ephesus to visit Paul, to tell Paul, hey, guess what? We have founded a church in Colossae, and these are the things that we are doing. Colossae, so like I said, that Paul never visited there, the best that we can tell. We have no evidence that he visited Colossae. But he wrote this letter to send with Epaphras back to the church in Colossae to give them encouragement. I'm sure that while Paul was in, in prison in Ephesus, everywhere Paul went, he was finding all these problems, whether he went to Philippi, Thessalonica, Corinth, Athens, he was always the center of controversy. He was getting imprisoned a lot. And in fact, even in Acts chapter 22, he's in uh, his home country in Jerusalem, and he gets arrested. And then he's, he demands, oh, hey, you know what? I'm a Roman. You can't punish me like that. Okay, yeah. And they took him to Rome, and then they executed him. I'm sure he needed a lot of encouragement. Everywhere he went, he was causing waves around him. There was a lot of controversy everywhere he went. And he, I'm sure, you know, I imagine him being in, in prison, if that's accurate, like Dr. Wright says, that if he was in prison in about 51 AD, and this is about 20 years after Jesus was crucified, he needed some encouragement. And how encouraging would that be for Epaphras to come pay a visit to say, we've started this church. It is not a church that you started. It is not a church that was visited here by Peter or by Barnabas or by Silas or by Timothy, or Titus. We are just people who have heard the word and we started our Christian church. We want to let you know about it. How encouraging would that be to, to Paul that the word is actually growing? So this is a new church and it's in a city. Colossae, is a, it was at the time, it was in, it, it was in its decline. If you visit Colossae today in Dr. Wright's book, Dr. N.T. Wright's book, uh, he says that um, Colossae, um, if you visit it today, you can find no ruins. They have done no excavations or archaeological digs in Colossae. He said that's a, that's a shame. But what, what you do is if you're standing at, at Colossae, there's a lake. It's right on the shore of a lake. And there's two other cities from antiquity. There's Hierapolis and uh, Laodicea. Laodicea was the, was the primary city for, for that area. But if you stand in any one of those cities, you could look across the lake and see the other two, the other two towns. Laodicea became the uh, city of prominence, but you know, the, uh, for uh, Colossae to be waning on its decline, I imagine maybe that's where they could, they could meet people who were left behind, where the, the wealthy, whether the people who are successful, and, and in the Roman world, it was all about class, and you could not move around class. If you were low class, you were stuck there. There was nothing you could do about it. So I imagine a city that's on its decline, they leave behind the lower class and the disheartened and the people who feel discouraged, and that's where God chose to start his church in that area was there in Colossae. So we have a group of believers who just endeavor on their own to build this church. They contact Paul, fills him with the encouragement, 
and his letter sent to the Colossians in this section that we just read through, the first 14 verses, are about thanks. They're about thanksgiving. And we learn the, the, the echoes of Paul's teaching, which are faith, hope, and love. So with faith, that Paul's thanksgiving prayers, uh, thanks, Paul's thanksgiving and prayer for the church in verses 2 through 8 is the, he, he outlines the essence of the gospel. So, he starts out with, uh, you know, something that's very interesting is that he uses the term brother. When he introduces himself, I, Paul, and Timothy, he, uh, he refers to Timothy as his brother. And this is something that, if you want to find out, did Paul write these letters the, an element of why we know that these letters were written by Paul are by certain elements that, that are consistent. One of those things is he refers to Timothy as brother. He also, in Romans, refers to Cordus as brother he, in 1 Corinthians, and then in, in two places in uh, chapter 1, and then in 16, refers to other believers as brother. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that we are family, and that is an important component to think of with our the people that surround us in this room is that we are believers and we are family. Very important component because we have faith. We have faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. And as we find throughout the whole Old Testament that uh, the description of the body of the believer, that we are components of a body, that we are a family. Um, with the faith that we, uh, we know that there is a better tomorrow and faith and love are the two sides of the coin for Christian living. We need to center our Christian living in the faith in Jesus Christ and love for our fellow neighbors. As Jesus pointed out, that's the most important commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because we have that faith, that gives us the hope. In some, some portions, he refers to this as joy. We hope, we have that hope based on what we know. We can see around us the encouragement, like Paul in that prison cell, when Epaphras comes and says, hey, we started this church in, Col in Colossae, and he is encouraged by God is working. The faith is bearing fruit. That when you plant a seed, it takes, think of the discipline it takes when, uh, for those of you who plant anything. If you take a seed and put it in the ground and then you nurture it with the right kind of light, with um, the moisture content, if some people get really into the types of soil and the uh, acidity of the soil, whatever that is necessary to have that seed sprout, it's a miracle when that seed sprouts. It's not by anything that we do, it's just by God at work. And then that plant grows to maturity into something that is entirely different than that seed. It can become an oak tree, it can become an orange tree, it could become a mustard tree, it could be anything. But God knows what it is. The, uh, the seed sprouts as a miracle comes to, to maturity. It takes a lot of discipline and faith when someone is planting a whole crop and they're investing the time, energy, money to plant that crop for it to, to grow to maturity, to then harvest, you have the hope that there's going to be a fruitful future. Same thing, that when we act in faith that Jesus is God of the universe, he is one of the Trinity, the Son of God that has created the entire universe, we know that there is a better future for us. It is the one true God. In this, um, in this section, in, in verse, uh, verse 11, um, verse 11, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for patience and long-suffering with joy. The Greek term for this is macrothumia, and that is translated sometimes as long-suffering, sometimes as patience. It's enduring we can go through periods of drought we can suffer through 
periods of discouragement. We can go through periods of mistreatment because we have the faith and we have the hope for a better future, that God has a plan for us, we are working God's plan, and that there is going to be a prosperous future in the belief in the one true God. And so that brings us to the love. Paul stresses that love is the opposite side of the coin from, from faith, that if you love God, love your neighbor, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. As we look around us, that um, I know that growing up, that I uh, personally, I, I had a lot of episodes of selfishness when I was younger, believe it or not, that I, um, when I was a teenager, I was too cool for adults, that the adults were just the outsiders, that they, um, they were just a tool for getting resources. Oh, I need a ride, so I'll go to an adult. Hey, I need uh, money, so I'll go to an adult or go to my parents. And um, it was really a selfish thing that they, they'd say, hey, you know, I've given you the money, I've given you a ride, I've done this for you. Can I get you to take out the trash? Oh my gosh, again, why am I gonna do this? If we have the faith and we have the hope for a better future, we should look outside of ourselves and understand the love that people have given us. God, how does God show his love for us? Because people work in our lives to show love to us. And if you open your eyes and see that actually people have helped, me, help, helped us out, um, the other day I went to uh, a store and uh, asked, for, asked for something, and the person was very helpful and very cheerful, and it really took me by surprise. I was, um, was kind of awkward about the whole interaction that it took me by surprise that much that I'm not used to being treated that way. Um, I was in my work uniform and everything, and I'm so used to not getting the best treatment from people, and so uh, I had to stop the person. I had to tell her, you know what, thank you. I really appreciate how nice you've been to me. You've been very helpful, and uh, I hope that made her feel a little bit better for, for the rest of the day, but that's the least that I could do is to say thank you, and that's something that I really hope that we can, as we open our eyes and see the hurting people in the world, that we reach out to help them because too often uh, let me just speak for myself. Um, there's a saying that I've heard that um, no good deed goes unpunished. And that certainly rang true with uh, many times that I've gone to help someone only to walk away and say, gosh, I should have never helped that person in the first place. You know, they really made me feel sorry for trying to do something nice. We need to look past that. There are going to be those moments. If you ever want to quench your thirst for helping others, go help someone and see how, how long that lasts. Uh, you're going to get some discouragements. But God wants us to stay true in the faith. God is everlasting, and he wants our love to be everlasting. God wants us to go out and see the hurting people and help them. The way to do that is to open our eyes to how people have helped us I am a sinner. I have wronged others. I have done things that I should not have done, and I have mistreated others. People have extended me grace. And I can say that I've, I've been at this church since 1997, and many of you know a lot of my faults. And I have, I have not heard anyone tell me that, you know what, you shouldn't be up there at that pulpit. You shouldn't be doing what you're doing because I know your past. No one in this room have I heard say that. Believe me, I know that there's reasons why I should not, theoretically, by the standards of this world, be doing what I'm doing. But God has me here. God wants you to be doing what you are doing. God wants us to be believers. We have the faith. We have the hope. Now let's have the love as we go into this Christmas season when we say Merry Christmas and someone wants to correct us, don't hold that against them. Stay true to the faith. Express your values that Jesus is the one 
and only true way for everlasting life. It is universal. It is open to everyone, but not everyone will accept. But we, we do so with love, not with bitterness, not with, not with envy, because there's going to be plenty of times when I've struggled with people who do all the wrong things and there's no reason they should be prospering. I get, I get so discouraged by, by seeing people who seem to have life so well when they have done all the wrong things, you know, when we have, we'll just leave it at that, that when people do the wrong things, things that they shouldn't be doing, mistreating others, and yet they, they seem to prosper. We know, the, we know the, long, the long end game, that for them, unless they repent, it leads to ruin. Let's repent, and that is the central theme from Genesis to Revelation, is to repent. We have done things one way, the worldly way. Now let's repent and go a, a different direction. Be more Christ-like. That's what God wants us to do. And so as we go through, um, as we go forward, let's, uh, let's remember some uh, core Baptist uh, tenets, which are uh, convictions of the Baptist faith, and this is according to Dr. Marshall Johnston, that Jesus is Lord. Conversion to Christ is essential. That means that we have to be, uh, we choose Jesus. Jesus is the one way to get to everlasting life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He said it, I believe it. The Bible is the sole written authority of our faith. You should read your Bible. If anything, even if you're, if you're a fan of literature like I am, like I've uh, just been reading through uh, Judges and Ruth and First and Second Samuel, First, First and First Kings and First and Second Chronicles, and I will tell you the, the story of David, that is one of the best bits of literature that you can go through. It rivals William Shakespeare, William Shakespeare Dostoevsky, any of those great writers. I'm telling you right now, that, that is some good stuff. If you take the time to read through it, if you're a fan of literature, at least do that. But read your Bible, read through Colossians. It's not, a, it's not very long. You could do it probably in 15 minutes. And, um, but the Bible... If you read it enough and really soak it in, you will certainly be a better, better person for it. And read through it, not for the information. Don't try to, uh, you know, we get into these arguments like Roger Williams and Governor Bradford had these arguments. It really had to do with infant baptism. Roger Williams said, we believe in believer's baptism. In order for faith to be valid, it must be voluntary. So you can't have a baby that doesn't know what's going on and uh, baptize them and, and have that be uh, valid. Uh, that's not a valid baptism, according to Roger Williams. And <clears throat> like Governor Bradford argued, well, that's the way to, that's actually the way that we get uh, citizenship, is that when you're baptized into the Anglican Church, you become a, uh, that's one of the um, components to become a, a, a citizen of, of England. But anyways, instead of getting, getting into these informational arguments, it's not a book of information, it's a book of transformation. How can I make myself a better person? Not how can you be a better person, how can I be a better person? Read through the Bible with that lens. And then fourth, for faith to be valid, it must be voluntary. That is what we believe. We believe in believer's baptism. And so if you, if you have um, heard this message and and been inspired that you have not accepted your life into accepted Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior. I want you to come forward and talk to me about it. If you're interested to come forward and join this church, we'd love to have you, and we'd love to have you as a, a voting member. Come forward and talk to me about that. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation, and we want you to come forward. Uh, let me pray first. Lord, we thank you for this time to come together and learn a little bit more about you to be encouraged that we um, 
sometimes go through periods of drought, that sometimes we go through periods of discouragement, sometimes we can feel alone. Encourage us that we are not alone, that you, the true God of the universe, are with us, that when we call your name, you are always with us, that you have us grow, and we have these periods of discouragement for our own growth as we transform from merely just a beginning believer to being more Christ-like, that we go through periods of, of discouragement so that we can grow and be more Christ-like. We ask that you uh, open our eyes to see the, the hurting world around us and how we can improve it. We want to make a contribution. We want to contribute because you want us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, and we certainly love you in Jesus name. Amen. So if you if you would let's stand and sing this uh, hymn of invitation which is Jesus I come. Jesus I come and let's sing. Out of my bondage sorrow and night I come, Jesus, I come into thy freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to thee out of my sickness. Jesus, I call.